that he has the best job in the world, which is he gets women pregnant and their husbands pay for it. <laughs> but he is an e le India's leading IVF specialist. So hereby, I welcome Dr. Anirudh Malkpani to speak on startup and entrepreneurship, quest to deliver the best through innovation. Thank you, sir. Tea, caffeine levels are good enough, blood sugar levels are good enough, no one's gone off to sleep. You know, one thing I've learned, when I start worrying that people are going to sleep, I pick on people and say, okay, you there in the black suit or something, get up and answer the question. So make sure no one's sleeping through this. So when I first started as an IVF doctor, this was nearly 30 years ago, people didn't know what IVF was, was test tube babies were, so I would spend a lot of time explaining that. Now that I'm an angel investor, I find I have to spend a lot of time explaining what angel investors do. And the first question I think I need to ask everyone is, where are the healthcare startup success stories? We've got all these unicorns across all fields, whether it's Ola, whether it's Oyo. You know, where are the healthcare startups? Practo was funded eight years ago. There is so much money, but what's the impact of that been? Has it really affected the quality of care which patients are getting or doctors? And why has it been such a damp squib? That's the question we need to ask ourselves if we really want to change things. And I think this is the reason why so many healthcare startups fail. Because typically a lot of the innovation, in fact, even if you look at this, the stalls here, most of the healthcare startups are started by techies. You know, it's either someone from IIT or someone else. And then the moment you develop a technology, whether it's AI, whether it's ML, whether it's blockchain, You've got to say, okay, which particular market do I address? What particular problem can I solve? So that effectively it becomes a technology looking for a problem to solve. I think this is a big problem because if you don't have enough doctors on your team, if you don't understand what the pain point of doctors are, no one is going to adopt your technology. And then this is the big problem. All healthcare techies keep on saying doctors are dinosaurs. Kuch samajhta nahi hai. They don't want to use smartphones. They don't want to use apps. But guess what? These are the, this is the newest advance. Let's try this. this. Every doctor is going to start using this thing, but it's very hard to change doctor's behavior. It's very hard to change your own behavior, isn't it? How many of you have tried to lose weight and failed? All of us. Yes, you know, I've been there, done that. If we can't manage to change our own behavior, why would you expect a doctor who's been practicing for 10 years, doing things a particular way, change his behavior just because you come to him with some particular app? And a big problem is doctors don't trust engineers anymore. I've been trying out apps and EMRs and EHRs and practice management systems for the last 15 years using whatever the state of the art technology was at that time. And I've burnt my fingers enough. And I think a big problem is doctors think engineers don't understand anything about what we try to do. Good reason. How many engineers here have spent time in a government OPD? I'm glad, I'm glad someone is being empathetic. But imagine if you guys want to run a healthcare startup and you haven't spent at least a week trying to live in a doctor's shoes, how are you ever going to provide solutions which are appropriate for Indian practice? This is what Indian hospitals look like, not like the fancy five-star hospitals which you will see from Silicon Valley startups. Please understand, none of American solutions are at all going to work within Indian context. This is a challenge and an opportunity. The challenge, of course, is that you need to simplify things. You need to make them so that a doctor within four minutes can actually use whatever solution you're offering. And the opportunity is no one else in the rest of the world is going to bother to create these kind of solutions. You have a great chance to do this yourself. There is no question that we've been hearing about the promise of digital health for so many decades. And I think everyone agrees that healthcare is broken, the only way to make it affordable, available, accessible is through technology. How do we do that? And there is no question that startups can improve everything, all the way from the patient journey, the doctor journey, diagnostics, treatment, monitoring, everything else. But I think the big problem is we're going this the wrong way around. Rather than trying to get programmers and computer guys to understand how doctors work, I think this is perhaps the question we need to be answering. And I think the answer is actually very simple. Guess where doctors hang out? Hospitals. That's where we need to start. And I think if we start from here, and therefore rather than expect innovation to occur 
within laboratories or IITs, it makes more sense to start where the patients and the doctors are in hospitals. Hospitals are great platforms for innovating because this is where the medical students are who are young, who are willing, have an open mind, willing to try things. This is where the patients are. This is where the patient's relatives are. These are people who've traveled from far off. They're illiterate, they're poor, they're ignorant. They're happy to use any opportunity you can give them to have a better experience. And we can put all this together in a hospital bedside to make sure that the solutions you provide will work for Indian patients. And I think this is my most important emphasis, that the innovation has to start from the bedside. It can't possibly start from in your head, yes, I think this needs to be cool, or you visit a doctor's clinic, you're unhappy that you had to wait for 10 minutes, and then you come up with a solution to help the doctor manage his queue, because that's not going to work in the real world. You need far more domain expertise. And within a hospital setting, you have senior doctors who have a wealth of clinical experience. They understand what the pain points are. They would be your ambassadors and your evangelizers and will be able to tell you, is your solution going to work or not? And if you can get doctors to buy in by going to these hospitals, I think a lot of these problems will be solved. I don't know how many of you know about this Vetic. This is the technology innovation part of IIT, and they call 4Ds for medical device innovation. And I think it's extremely well done. First, you start off by defining an unmet clinical need. So you don't say, hey, I'm a blockchain expert, and therefore I want to see how we can use blockchains to keep the data of EMR secure. It doesn't work that way. You've got to find out what is the pain point which doctors and patients have. Then you go back to the lab and you design a prototype, which engineers and programmers are good at, but it's great to have a doctor sitting along with you. Finally, whatever you get, you deliver to the bedside. And it's so hard for computer engineers and programmers to get access to a hospital. We all know that. No one will let you go to the OPD. No one will let you go to the OT. Doctors don't have time to talk to you. But if you start off from the hospital setting, then everything is open to you. And finally, deploy it in the market. And this is a simple four-step process for anyone. And it's true whether it's medical devices. It's true whether it's medical programs, because this is where you need to start off with. I think this is a great analogy. And I think this is the difference in this one slide between the way a doctor thinks and the way an engineer thinks. And as doctors, we are forced to think about this one-on-one. -on -one. Every patient who comes to us, because it's clinical medicine, we need to concentrate on what can I do to get that patient better. We don't have the bandwidth. We don't have the ability to have a big picture, which is what engineers can bring in. And that's why we need to marry both these strengths together. The big problem is it always seems to be confrontational. Doctors think engineers don't understand. Engineers think doctors don't understand. And it's high time we learn to bridge the gap. Why do we have this difference in mindset? Because doctors are conservative. You know, we've been doing the same way in appendicectomy operation for so many years because the appendix has remained exactly the same. An appendicectomy operation in Paris is going to look exactly like the one which you're going to do in Bombay. And we can't afford to experiment with our patients. Engineers are completely different. You give them something, even if it's working, the first thing they will do is take it apart, see how it works, and try to make it work even better. Doctors can't afford to take this mindset. And that's important because doctors, when they're in the operation theater, on the bedside or in the clinic, they need to be conservative. That's in vivo. But when you're stepping outside your clinic, you need to think in vitro. So this, for example, is some of the stuff which is available in tinkering labs to help doctors to innovate. This is a picture of what's called the Stanford Center for Biodesign. This is one of the world's leading centers for helping in a multidisciplinary platform, doctors, design thinkers, engineers, patients, caregivers, pharma companies, everyone to come together and come up with solutions which work. We're trying to do exactly the same thing, but on a much smaller scale. We've done a public-private partnership with this government of Maharashtra. This is a hospital in JJ Hospital. The lab is called Mice Labs. And this is what we're trying to do. You have all these first MBBS, second MBBS, third MBBS students. When they're still young, when they're open-minded, we're trying to get them to tinker in the Mice Lab. We help them to do things. And I'll tell you, the response has been so gratifying because they're so excited about the fact. A lot of them did well in physics and maths, 
A lot of them did well in medicine. They managed to get admission into IIT and into medicine. You have to be smart to get into medicine, right? But they're disappointed because they can't do anything with their hands, and now they're getting this opportunity to do that. But I will say one thing, two big problems. For one thing, medical students in India are much younger than medical students elsewhere in the world. So they're that to extent far more immature. And this learning curve is so hard because the syllabus is so packed with things that the only time they actually get a chance to come to the tinkering lab is on Saturdays. And what we're trying to tell them is instead of sitting in the library, come and visit the lab. But that will happen in the future, maybe 10, 15 years. But this is what doctors look like today, right? And I think there are three things I think doctors can interact with the startup ecosystem. One is as angel investors. I'll describe my personal experience. The second is entrepreneurs themselves. And I'll explain why doctors have such a hard time being entrepreneurs. And finally, as customers. Everyone thinks of angel investors like this, right? All the money in the world, nothing better to do to interview entrepreneurs. Man me aya to check likha, ni aya to nahi likha, not answerable, never bother to reply to emails or anything else, right? I wish that were true, but what has my journey been? And I need to emphasize that it's been a long learning journey and I'm continuing to learn every day. I'm on a board of a company called IKS, which was started 10 years ago. One of the reasons I needed to reinvent myself is my daughter is, neither of my daughters are doctors. And I need to be able to understand what language they're speaking. And because she did her MBA, at least now, if I do things on a daily basis, I understand what she is going through. It was very helpful to join Mumbai Angels as a network because as a doctor, I didn't understand what a balance sheet was. I didn't understand what EBITDA was. And now I can do it through a more organized fashion. It's become much easier to become an angel investor today. It used to be extremely hard. There are so many resources available. But for me, again, I need to emphasize the reason I'm an angel investor is this is what the T-shaped model of learning how to lead your life is. In the beginning, you develop the vertical stem of the T, so you acquire functional expertise. So I'm an extremely good IVF specialist. I've been doing this for 30 years. But beyond a particular point, it's just that. How do you apply what you've learned to other parts of the world? And that's where you go broad. And that's what I'm exploring today. This is what our website is. We try to be open and transparent because we think that is something which is lacking in the startup ecosystem. Entrepreneurs don't seem to understand what in investors are looking for and vice versa as well. Our approach is simple. We try to be founder friendly. We respect entrepreneurs. It's not easy being an entrepreneur, taking so many risks. And therefore, we also tell them this is the kind of entrepreneur we're looking for. We're not going to be right for everyone. There are some people who are too early, some people who are too late. Our philosophy is one of frugal innovation. I'm not a VC. And if the match is right, I think we make good partners. But entrepreneurs need to decide that. And therefore, we have a well-defined investment thesis, all of which is available on our website. And the reason we are so honest and transparent is if I say something on a public platform and do something differently, I will get into trouble. Which is why we're saying, look, this is what we do, and if we don't live up to that, please call us out so we can improve. This, of course, is how we pick which entrepreneurs to back. And the first line may seem very funny, because the first thing everyone thinks is, oh, you become an angel investor because you expect to make a lot of money, right? Completely wrong. Most people will lose money on angel investments, because most startups will fail which doesn't mean that I'm stupid when I invest in them. I'm the eternal optimist. I'm hoping I will succeed. But even if I don't, I'm not going to lose sleep over it because I understand that it's a high-risk asset class. For me, I look at what I call my learning on investment rather than a financial return on investment. And the three things we're looking for in an entrepreneur is integrity. He needs to be honest. He needs to be curious. But more importantly, he needs to be, have humility there are lots of things he can teach us, but conversely, perhaps there are lots of things we can teach him because we've been doing this for quite a few years, and hopefully that's what makes it a successful marriage. But for me, the most important thing I'm looking for is do you have paying customers? And I'll tell you why. We follow a particular process. We say we're going to back the entrepreneur. Interestingly, we have a soft corner for failed entrepreneurs. They've already earned, learned their lessons, so hopefully they won't repeat the same set of mistakes. They'll make new mistakes. We all make mistakes all the time, but hopefully they'll be less expensive. Women entrepreneurs, 
I'm not being sexist, but the reality is that if you become an entrepreneur as a woman, the hurdles you need to cross are 10 times the hurdle which a man needs to cross. So straight away, you've differentiated yourself from the rest of the competition. And I have a soft corner for social impact investing, but I'm quite happy to invest in any domain as long as I think the entrepreneur can teach me. Therefore, I'm domain agnostic. Again, signing the check is the glamorous stuff. You know, that's when you get a press release, so-and-so got raised so much money. But the hard work only starts afterwards. And this, we are very actively engaged. We want the entrepreneur to give us a report. Are you using the money well? Are you running out of money? What can we do to help you? And we're happy to provide introductions. That's some of the, this is our portfolio. And I need to remind doctors who want to become angel investors, you will not become rich. Only invest the money you can afford to lose without losing sleep over and have realistic expectations. Some principles use a portfolio approach because you cannot predict in advance which startup will succeed and which will fail and join a network. But it's not a get rich scheme. Let me warn you, you'll burn your fingers and be unhappy. And the good thing again, as I said on the internet, there are so many great books you can read. So before you sign a single check as an angel investor, read all the books so at least you understand what entrepreneurs are going through. I enjoy being an angel investor because it helps me to be optimistic about the future. You know, when you become old, all you start doing is complain about the world is going to the dogs, patients don't respect doctors anymore. When you hang out with young entrepreneurs, some of their optimism rubs off onto you as well. I think doctors make good angel investors because we're taught to be empathetic. We understand what the emotional journey of the entrepreneur is. And I think we have a lot of goodwill in the community. More importantly, by understanding the business an entrepreneur runs, doctors in private practice become better businessmen. But the problem is doctors don't make good entrepreneurs, even though actually they're the ones who should be starting startups because they're not good team players. You know, when you're operating on a patient, the patient's life is in your hands. You can't afford to delegate it to someone else. So we're not good team players. We're not taught to tinker. And in college, all you learn from is your professors, none of whom are entrepreneurs themselves. So no one really teaches some of these skills. And I think that's a lost opportunity. Again, as an entrepreneur, I need to emphasize the fact, please don't ask an investor to fund an idea. Ideas are a dime a dozen. I get about 100. Anyone who wants ideas, please reach out to me. I'm happy to share hundreds of them with you. It's implementing the idea, which is hard. And we will only fund if you come to us and show that you have skin in the game and you've implemented. The more the ideas you have, the better your ideas will become. And no one's going to steal your ideas, trust it. We all have enough of our own. If you're doctors and you want to become entrepreneurs, be willing to take risks. Be prepared to fail. It's not like running a clinic. The odds are stacked against you. But it will teach you a lot. I promise you that. It will teach you a lot about yourself and they teach you a lot about the rest of the world. And that's why this is something which is worth doing. The most important thing if you want to be an entrepreneur is you need to learn. In order to become an entrepreneur, you need to sell. And in order to sell, you need to tell stories. Because all of us are emotional creatures. Our cerebral cortex kicks in only after the limbic system has been engaged. And the best way is to work in a startup. You'll get a much better sense of what's going on. And hopefully, you will then get the courage to do your own startup as well. What is bootstrapping? Which means you fund your own startup. The biggest problem today is you get a good idea, you send an email to an investor. Here's my idea, here's my pitch deck, will you fund me? Doesn't happen that way, so don't even try. Your customers are where your funding should come from. And if your customers are willing to fund you, investors will fund you as well. I can promise you that. Lots of books again. And this is something I still don't understand. A lot of entrepreneurs take perverse pride in the fact that we legal term sheet, we don't have financial statement, we don't have unit economics. I mean, you better learn to do these things because you're not playing games. You're running a business. And you cannot run a business until you understand sales, marketing, HR, legal, finance. And the buck stops with you. And if you don't want the buck to stop with you, do everyone a favor and don't become an entrepreneur because you'll just create heartburn and grief. What about doctors as customers? And this is often what doctors think about EMRs. You do something, it goes wrong and it blows up in your face. I also think doctors should give young entrepreneurs a chance. And again, as 
Dr. Ganpati said, what's in it for the doctor? He will get to learn a lot about what cutting-edge technology is and what the future holds. And then, of course, if you enjoy what the entrepreneur is bringing to your clinic, the best thing you can do is invest in them. So you can mentor healthcare startups, and it helps you remain. The dollar sign was just a joke. You're not going to make any money as an angel investor, so don't even expect that. So all of us are big fish in small ponds. I think the opportunity is to continue growing. And I think if we work together, there's a lot we can do as doctors and engineers to help our patients grow. And anyone who wants to get in touch with me, please don't connect me with, on my mobile. There is an email address there. I'm available on LinkedIn. I'm more than happy to answer emails. But the last suggestion I'm going to give you, the chances of your getting a reply to your email are in direct proportion to how much time and energy you spend in crafting that email. So if you're serious about it, don't send generic emails. Don't send an email, do you have time for a coffee? Because busy investors don't have time for coffee. But if you pitch your email in such a way that I say, wow, that sounds interesting, I want to find out more, that email will give you permission to come and send me a more detailed presentation. That's the only thing you should be aiming for. Thank you very much, guys. All day. I, I'm more than happy to answer questions, but it's not fair on the next speaker. Because as it is, we're running late, and then we keep on this thing. But I'm more than happy to answer questions, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks. The youngest successful entrepreneur present here to present the memento to sir. Thank you. You've done this before. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir.